Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all having a good day. I broke a mirror this morning, so that is how my day, if not my week, is going. So um, great, seven years of bad luck for me, even though I'm still on my last seven years. I broke a mirror about four years ago, so I'm still serving that sentence. So today's case um, is unbelievable. Like that is the only word that I can use to describe it. When I was doing my research for this case, I had to keep reminding myself that it was real. This case is real and it actually happened. Because today we're going to be talking about one of the largest mass kidnapping cases in US history. Today we're going to be covering the case of the Chow Chilla kidnapping. But just like a brief summary, because I still cannot believe that this actually happened. It involves a school bus full of children. There were 26 children on this school bus along with the driver and this school bus was hijacked by these kidnappers. The 26 children were kidnapped and then buried alive. 26 school children and their bus driver have vanished. Anguished parents, President Ford, hundreds of searching police are asking the question, where are the children? It's like, how can that actually happen? How can 26 school children be buried alive? Like, how does that happen? Like, it just doesn't seem real. It sounds like I have just told you the plot for a movie, not a real life case. And I'm sure as you're watching this video, you're going to have to keep reminding yourself as well, oh my God, this is real because there are so many shocking twists and turns. And we actually have three evil perpetrators in today's case. We have the ringleader, Fred Woods, and then his two evil sidekicks who were Jim and Rick Schoenfeld, who were brothers. So that is what we're going to be covering today. And we're gonna try and figure out why these three men decided it was a good idea to kidnap 26 school children and bury them alive. So let's just jump in. I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object murder mystery game where you play as Detective June Parker and each new level takes you through a thrilling mystery where you have to find as many hidden objects as possible to help you solve the murder. Now you guys already know how much I love June's Journey. I could literally waste so many hours playing this game. It's just such a relaxing game and I love finding all of the hidden objects and it keeps my brain engaged but also distracted at the same time. I just feel like I completely zone out when I'm playing June's Journey and the game has such a gorgeous design and the murder mystery storyline is just incredible. Like it's literally the perfect game for me because I love hidden object games. It's murder mystery and we all love that over here. And one of my favorite parts of June's Journey is that you get to build and decorate your own island. Like seriously, I am a sucker for this kind of feature. I love building my my own world. I love decorating things, even if I'm not very good at it. I love it. I love choosing your own little furniture and like placing it where you want to and your own little decorations, which leads me on to some very, very, very exciting news. Seeing as decorating my island is my favorite part of June's journey, June's journey have decided to create my very own decoration items, which I just can't believe like what? June's Journey have decided to create two decoration items based on this channel, which is just incredible. Like I still can't believe it. Like what the hell? So the first decoration item is called Detective Danielle, which of course is based on me. And then the second item is called Daisy's Discovery, which of course is based on my cute little puppy. And then because I'm Detective Danielle, little Daisy here is supposed to be my sidekick. And the idea behind the little scene is that Daisy over here is supposed to be digging in the ground and she's found a pile of money in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> and this pile of money that Daisy has found is actually a clue. And then because I am the detective, you can see me pointing over at Daisy because she's found a clue. And I'm trying to alert the police officer to the fact that little Daisy has found a clue. And then just to make the scene extra British, there is a red telephone box because yeah, why not? So that is what the decoration items are supposed to be. Detective Danielle with her little sidekick, Daisy. And together we are solving crime. And both of those items are available right now. So you can decorate your island with them, which is just 
so crazy. Like, it's so weird. Like, I cannot get over that me and Daisy are in June's journey. <laughs> oh, bless her. I think she's tired. And if you guys wanted to get those items, you can download June's journey for free by using the link in my description box. And then the first item, Daisy's discovery, is actually a free gift. A free gift from Daisy. That's right. It is actually Daisy's birthday on Tuesday. So this is a little gift from Daisy to all of you. <laughs> and then the second item, Detective Danielle, will be available to purchase from the store up until the 31st of December 2022. But June's Journey are doing a giveaway, which means that you have the opportunity to win the Detective Danielle decoration item for free. All you have to do is fill out a short quiz and don't worry, the questions are very, very easy. And then enter your user ID from the game. And there are full instructions on how to get both decoration items in the description down below. So please check out the description box for instructions on how to get Daisy's Discovery for free. And then also how you can win Detective Danielle. But I will say there are a limited number of Detective Danielle decoration items that we are giving away for free. So if you are interested in Detective Danielle, please make sure to go and look at the instructions and enter as soon as possible. Thank you again to June Shiny for sponsoring today's video and making me and Daisy a part of the game. Like that's just crazy. But a huge thank you from me and Daisy to every single one of you watching right now, because truly without all of you guys, we wouldn't get opportunities like this, would we Daisy? So thank you again for all of your support. And now let's jump into today's case. So even though there are three evil perpetrators to today's case, that is definitely a ringleader. And their name is Frederick Woods. And he goes by Fred, so we're just gonna call him Fred. And Fred was born on October 15th, 1951, making him a Libra. Now, as a Libran myself, we do not claim him. And he grew up in Portola Valley, which is just outside of San Francisco in California, where he lived with his parents, Fred Sr. and Harriet. Now, one thing that you should know about Fred is that he is rich. He is filthy, stinking rich. His family has so much money and his family, it was like generational wealth. It was old money. His dad, Fred Sr., had inherited the family wealth and he was now a successful businessman himself. They lived in a very wealthy community in the Santa Cruz Mountains and it is said that Fred was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Like I know we do talk about privilege and these people are privileged, blah, 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 but Fred is about as privileged as one can get. He comes from a family that is one of those old, powerful, rich families. However, even though Fred grew up very privileged, he also grew up very lonely. As a child, he was described as just a little bit different. He was also described as shy and awkward. Kids would often make fun of him and he really struggled to make friends. He was also incredibly lonely in the house because his parents just didn't really bother with him. They didn't really put him first. They didn't make him a priority. His parents, as we know, are filthy rich, but they would use that money for themselves. They would go traveling around the world and they would leave Fred behind. He would be stuck with nannies, just people looking after him for months on end whilst his parents were off traveling around the world having the time of their lives. Fred never formed a close bond or connection with either one of his parents and it's said that if you looked at the family photographs around the house there would be photos of Fred's parents together in the various locations that they would travel to around the world and then there would just be photos of Fred on his own. There would never be a family photograph because they were never together. And also, just in case if you were wondering, Fred wasn't an only child, even though we haven't exactly mentioned any siblings. But that is because when Fred was just six years old, his sister was born. And after the birth of his sister, his parents learned that his sister had Down syndrome. And as soon as Fred's parents realized that their daughter had Down syndrome, they put her into care. And that sister, I don't even know what her name is, was never seen again by Fred. And by the time Fred moved into his teenage years, he only really had one thing on his mind, and that was getting his father's acceptance. All of those years being neglected by his dad had definitely taken a toll on Fred, and he just wanted his dad to show him love, affection. His dad would always tell him that he was never going to live up to the family name, that he was never going to be as successful as he was, which 
which just made Fred want his father's acceptance and approval even more. But getting his dad's approval would be something that Fred would never be able to achieve. Because Fred, no matter how hard he tried, he didn't get the best grades at school, which was a disappointment to his dad. Fred also could never hold down a job. Again, this was a disappointment to his dad. He had no drive to succeed in life. He had no drive to stand on his own two feet because basically his whole life he had just been handed everything. So why would he have that motivation? Okay, so that was Fred's childhood basically. Now we jump forward to the early 70s and Fred is 19 years old. Fred had now left high school and it was at this age that Fred got married to his high school sweetheart but pretty much like everything else in Fred's life, this marriage was not successful. First of all, Fred was selfish to the extreme. He was lazy, he didn't work, and he lived off the monthly check that his dad would write him. I know, he's living off a monthly check of his parents. And he would spend every single penny on himself, nothing on his wife, nothing on the household, it was all on himself. He would buy himself multiple cars. He had a house full of antiques. He would buy himself whatever he wanted, even if he didn't really want it. He would buy it because why not? He's got the money. But it wasn't just money that was an issue in the marriage. Fred was also just a little bit weird. First of all, Fred didn't get on with anyone. He didn't like people. He didn't like his family. He didn't have any friends. He didn't like his wife. He was very isolated. He was very shut off. And if anyone ever came on his land, he would get his shotgun and fire it above their heads to scare them off. There was also an incident where Fred, he was out on some fields by his house and he came across a dead body. And instead of maybe the normal response by being freaked out, maybe being traumatized, maybe being panicky, it's said that Fred was actually thrilled and exhilarated by finding this dead body. And his wife was just really freaked out by the way he reacted to this dead body. It's like, who the hell gets excited and exhilarated by a dead body? If anyone, anyone feels excited and is exhilarated by dead bodies, that is a red flag. So it was less than a year before the marriage ended and they got divorced. And this was seen as a failure. Once again, Fred had failed. And following the divorce, Fred really struggled to cope. He turned into a very bitter person. I mean, he was already pretty bitter anyway, so even more of a bitter person. He became even more isolated, even more lonely. He struggled even more to get a job. And because he struggled to get a job, he actually ended up working for one of his dad's businesses because, you know, daddy to the rescue again. And Fred actually started working at a rock quarry, which was called the California Rock and Gravel Company. And this is very, very significant. The fact that he works at this rock quarry very significant. This is a huge part of the case. And this is when he is approximately around the age of 22. And it was at this age that he started to hang around a couple more people. And who were the people that he was now hanging around? Well, that is the other two evil perpetrators in today's case, Jim and Rick Schoenfeld. So Jim and Rick Schoenfeld were born in the 50s, in the early 50s. The exact date of birth is not actually known. And of course, they are brothers. Jim was the eldest by two years and then Rick was the younger. Now growing up, Jim and Rick were also incredibly privileged. Their family were not as wealthy as Fred because obviously Fred is old money. Well, the Schoenfelds were new money. So they didn't have that generational, like a lot of money but they were still very privileged. Their parents were still successful and they still had a lot of money. Just like Fred, they grew up in a very wealthy community just outside of San Francisco and they were spoiled, just like Fred. They actually did have very similar upbringings. I would say though that Jim and Rick's parents were more involved in their life because Fred's parents were basically MIA. Well, Jim and 
and Rick's parents were not like that, but they still were privileged. They were still spoiled. They were still born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They still didn't grasp reality. And they actually all attended the same high school, but they weren't friends in high school. It wasn't until 1974 where Fred and Jim are 22. They were both in the same year at high school and Rick is 20 that they actually reconnected and became really good friends. So this was just after Fred's divorce. He was really lonely and isolated and it's not entirely clear how they met but from what I could gather I think the situation was Fred reached out to Jim who he remembered from high school and he asked Jim hey I have some old used cars that I need fixing up do you want to help me and Jim I don't really know what his current situation was but he agreed straight away and he was like yeah sure but can my brother Rick come as well and that is how the three of them actually started spending time together they would fix up old cars and it wasn't long until they actually opened up a business together they opened up a used car business and at first their relationship was pretty innocent it started off as this really good friendship I mean they started a business together and it should have just stayed like that but it didn't because as time went by their conversations got a lot darker and it wouldn't be long until their diabolical plan started to form so first of all it seemed like all three of them all they would ever do was complain complain about about how hard their lives were. Now I'm not saying that their lives were not hard, like just because you've got money doesn't mean you haven't got a hard life, but they would constantly be complaining that their parents weren't proud of them. They would just complain that their parents were always disappointed in them, which are very valid complaints. But then they would also complain that their parents wouldn't give them enough money. They basically were spoiled rich kids that wanted everything handed to them. They thought that they deserved everything to be handed to them and they didn't wanna work for anything. And it was at this point when all three of them are in their early twenties that their parents pretty much cut them off. Their parents cut them off because they were lazy, entitled, unmotivated, unwilling to work and get money for themselves. So what did the lazy tree decide to do? Did they decide to actually go out, get a job like a normal person? Of course they didn't because they decided, oh, we have no money, therefore we need to steal. They began by stealing cars and actually commit grand theft auto. And at first they think, wow, this is great. We're stealing cars. We're really good at it. We're also making a lot of money. We don't need to rely on our parents. We can make it on our own. But it turns out that they weren't very good at it at all because they got caught very quickly. They got caught, arrested and charged, but uh, their rich parents came to the rescue and bailed them out and their punishment was just probation. So in their minds, they're thinking, wow, we got away with that. That was so easy and so fun. I do feel like they're kind of thrill seekers. So the three of them, because they got away with Grand Theft Auto, they were thinking, okay, we need to do something bigger. Like we need to do something that is going to make us more money. And at the same time they were also watching a lot of movies that were on kidnappings and bank robberies and heists and a lot of them did involve large ransom requests and they started to think to themselves why can't we do one of those? And I just don't know who the hell they're kidding because you have just been caught doing Grand Theft Auto. You are not good at crime, okay? And that is why I have really been emphasizing how privileged they are because they are delusional. The average person doesn't think that they can get away with something like that. But these three, because they are so delusional, because they don't live in the real world, they truly think that they can get away with something like this. Also, they're thinking to themselves that this is how they're are going to get rich, get rich quick. And at first it may have started off as a joke. Like, did they really take this seriously from the get-go? But it soon turned into a very serious plan that they wanted to commit a crime. They hadn't decided what to do yet, but they wanted to commit a crime where they could demand money, a ransom, and get a lot of money from that one crime. And they started to think to themselves, what could we do to demand a lot of money in a ransom demand. They were thinking, what could make us the most money? And that is when a light bulb went off in one of their heads. I don't know who it was, but a light bulb went off in one of their heads and they thought, children, children, 
children are what are going to get us the most money. And they wanted multiple children because the more children they kidnapped, the more money they could demand. And this was the moment that their diabolical plan started to form. And it's just crazy. I really do have to remind myself that this is real. I just feel like I am describing a movie plot right now. The dynamic of this group was that Fred was the ringleader, even though he is very antisocial, he's not very charismatic. And for some reason, a reason that I do not know, he seemed to have this weird control over over Jim. Fred would say jump and Jim would say how high. So then Jim was essentially the second in command, if you want to say that. And then Rick, who is Jim's younger brother, Jim also seemed to have this weird control over his younger brother. So when Jim would say jump, Rick would say how high. So that was kind of the dynamic of the group. Rick was definitely the weaker link, if you want to call him that. So over the next year, uh-huh, you heard that right. They were planning this for a very long time. So over the next year, Fred was pushing Jim and Rick into researching what the perfect crime would be. Because obviously they had decided to kidnap children, but they didn't know how they were going to do it. When we get to the end of 1976, the trio think that they have the perfect plan. And their perfect plan was to kidnap a school bus of children, hold them hostage, and demand five million dollars. And that was their plan. They were utterly convinced that this was the perfect plan, that nothing could go wrong, and they would get their five million dollars. And unfortunately, even though their plan is so far-fetched, I mean, how the hell do you kidnap a school bus full of children? Even though it sounds so far-fetched, it's true. It is exactly what happened. So now we get to the 15th of July, 1976, which is the day that the infamous kidnapping happens. And on this day, it was a sweltering day in California. I mean, it is in the middle of July. It is like over a hundred degrees outside. Also on this day, it just so happened to be the second to last day of summer school for the children attending the Dairyland Elementary School in Chow Chilla. Now, Chow Chilla is the place where the kidnapping took place. And this is a relatively small town. It's described as a farming town. It is approximately 100 miles outside of San Francisco. And it's just a really tight-knit community. It is a community where everyone knows each other. Also in the 70s, and I don't know if it's still like this today, I'm not sure. But in the 70s, it was described as a very safe town, a very safe, happy place to live. Nothing bad ever happened in Chowchilla. Now the children that were attending summer school got the bus there and the bus picked them up, took them to summer school, did their activities and everything and then brought them home and the bus always ran on schedule. The children would arrive back home at their parents every single day like clockwork. And on the 15th of July 1976 the children went to summer school in the morning. They actually did like their school work and then in the afternoon Afternoon, they always did like a fun activity, an outing or something like that. And on this day, the children went swimming. And around 4 p.m. on that day, the school bus arrived to take the children home from swimming. Now, the driver of this school bus was a man called Ed Ray. Now, Ed was in his 50s and he had driven this school bus for decades. He was the school bus driver. Everyone knew Ed. And the children that he was driving back and forth to school every day, he had also driven most of their parents to school when their parents were at school. So everyone knew Ed Ray. He was just a really friendly guy. He was loved by so many people. So on this day, the school children climb onto the bus after swimming. They've all had a really good day. They're all singing songs on the bus. Like it's literally a picture perfect school bus. And all these children are so happy they're all getting along however everything was about to change for these school children and this would change their lives 
forever. So Ed was driving the school bus. He'd already made a couple of stops. So some of the children had gotten off the bus. And then he was heading down this narrow back road. Currently there were 26 school children still on the bus. Now this back road was really quiet. Like you wouldn't see another car. And then all of a sudden up ahead, Ed sees a white van across the road. And this van was completely blocking the road. Now Ed's first thought was have they broken down and do they need help? Because that is the kind of community that Chow Chilla was. Everyone helped each other out. Everyone was really helpful and friendly. So Ed slows the bus down and comes to a stop in front of the van. But pretty much as soon as he had stopped the van, three men jumped out of this white van. They had pantyhose over their face. So their facial features were distorted and they were all carrying shotguns and all of them had their shotgun pointed at Ed. And then they shout at Ed with their guns pointing at him. If you even think about reversing, we'll shoot you. And then they demand that Ed opens up the door, the school bus door. Now, Ed, I do feel so sorry for him in this situation because it's like, what is he supposed to do? These three men have got shotguns and they're threatening to kill him. And the last thing that Ed wants is for these men to shoot him. And then the 26 school children that are still left on the bus, they'll be completely abandoned without an adult. So Ed thinks to himself, if I just comply, hopefully no one will get hurt. So he opens up the door and Fred, Jim and Rick jump onto the bus and obviously they have their pantyhose or tights if you're from the UK over their faces. And this must have been absolutely terrifying for those school children because the school children on this bus, they are so young. The age ranges are between five and 14, but the majority of the school kids are aged eight, nine and 10. So they are so young and they see these three men jump on the bus that all holding guns. I can't even imagine the terror that they must have been feeling in that moment. And the three of them start waving their guns around and start saying that everyone better do what they are told or else basically insinuating that you'll get shot. And the kids instantly start screaming. I mean, of course they do. But Fred, he tells everyone to shut up. And of course he's holding a shotgun. So everyone listens. And now Fred feels like he has full control over the situation. He orders Ed to get out of the driver's seat and make his way down to the back of the bus. And again, Ed does comply. And as he's walking to the back of the bus, he's trying to reassure the children that he's passing by giving them a smile, whispering, we'll be okay, or just giving them a squeeze on the shoulder. Ed is trying to comfort these children, but also not anger the three men. Then Jim jumps into the driver's seat of the bus. Fred positions himself at the front of the bus but facing backwards and he has his shotgun basically pointing at the school children but especially Ed and then Rick jumps off of the bus and gets back into the white van. The school bus pulls away and the white van follows and now 26 children as well as Ed so 27 people in total have now been kidnapped. So the first part of the plan is actually to ditch the school bus because a school bus is very recognizable. If you see this great big yellow school bus driving around, like it's going to be recognized. So the first thing they wanna do is get rid of it. So they drive about half an hour or so outside of Chowchilla until they come to this dry riverbed that is completely covered in bamboo. Now this bamboo is really, really tall. It is taller than a school bus. So they literally drive the school bus into the bamboo, like literally to cover it. And this location was chosen purposely for this because they wanted to conceal the school bus and this bamboo was about the best thing that was going to do that. Now, earlier on in that day, at this location at the bamboo, they had placed a second van because they would need two vans to transport the 27 people. So once the school bus is completely concealed in the bamboo, the two vans, are pulled up next to the school bus. They pull up the vans right by the doors of the school bus so the children and Ed wouldn't even need to touch the floor because they didn't want to leave any evidence of footprints, etc. So once the vans are ready, Fred, well, all three of them really, but especially Fred, force 
each child one by one to get up from their seat and walk down the aisle of the school bus and get into one of those vans. And can you imagine the absolute terror going through these children? They haven't got a clue what is going on. They don't have a clue what is possibly waiting for them in that van. For all they know, they are literally walking to their death. So Fred makes a child, he points at them, stand up, come here. So that child gets up and walks down the center of the bus, which must have felt like the longest walk of their life. And then that child was forced to get into one of those vans. Now inside these vans, they had been completely modified to be completely blacked out. The windows had been painted and literally every crack or anywhere that could possibly bring in light to the van had been covered. And I mean, when they got into these vans, it was completely complete darkness. The kind of darkness that makes you feel like you're being swallowed up. The inside of the vans had also been reinforced with wooden panels. They were essentially mobile prisons. And when Ed saw the inside of the van just before the doors closed, he thought, okay, this seems like a kidnapping of some sort. Obviously, he couldn't tell the children that. He was still trying to reassure the children that everything was going to be okay. Just to be responsible for that many children in a situation like this, I can't even imagine. I'm telling you, Ed and some of the children, but Ed is definitely a hero in this story. Now, Fred, Jim and Rick climb into the front of these vans and they drive off. And of course, because the back of the vans are completely blacked out, none of the children, or Ed can see anything. They don't know where they're going. At first, they are driving on like a gravel road because, you know, it's bumpy. They could tell. And then they soon got to smooth pavement. And once the vans were on the smooth road, the vans kept on driving for hours, hours and hours without stopping. Now, just to remind you, we are in California. It is mid-July. The temperatures are through the roof. And can you imagine how hot it would have been in the back of that van. There is literally no air in the back of this van. And there are literally 13 people in one van and 14 in the other with no air. There's no light. There is no food. There is no drink. There is obviously no bathroom. The children are starting to feel faint. There is no air. No one can feel like they can breathe properly. Then some children also started to throw up, probably from just being scared, from being sick, being car sick. And then because the vans were driving for hours and hours without stopping, naturally people started to need the toilet. Ed was actually encouraging the children to go to the toilet in the middle of the van because they were all kind of sat around the edge of the van. But Ed was encouraging the children to go to the bathroom in the middle of the van so they didn't have to sit in their mess. Ed and some of the older kids were trying to distract the younger kids. They were trying to comfort them, say that it was okay. They actually started to sing a song. They actually sang the song, If You're Happy and You Know It, Clap Your Hands, but they changed the word happy to sad. So they were singing, If You're Sad and You Know It, Clap Your Hands, which is just honestly heartbreaking. But the children couldn't calm down. I mean, of course they couldn't. They were trapped in a van and they were trapped in this van for 12 hours hours. That is how long this van was driving for. The van actually did stop about halfway to refill with gas. But other than that, they were constantly driving. And the children weren't let out, by the way, when they stopped for gas. And 12 hours, I just can't imagine 12 hours being stuck in the back of that van with pretty much no oxygen, no food, no water, no bathroom, no light. So meanwhile, back in Chowchilla, the parents had realized that their children were missing because like I said, the school bus always ran like clockwork. It was always on time. I mean, this is a very small town. You don't exactly get traffic jams. So it didn't take long for the parents to realize and start to panic. First, the school was flooded with phone calls asking where their children were, asking where Ed was. Initially, people had thought, oh, well, the school bus, maybe it's broken down. Maybe they had a flat tire. No one in their right mind, I mean, no one anywhere would think that a school bus of children have been kidnapped, but that didn't cross anyone's mind. But no one could find the school bus. There was a search party that went out looking for the school bus, expecting to find it on the side of the road needing help, but no one could find the school bus. No one could get into contact with Ed. He wasn't at home. 
Obviously, this is the 70s. People don't have mobile phones. However, eventually at 7.30 p.m., over three hours after the school bus should have returned, the news finally came in and the school bus was found in that bamboo field. And it was actually found from the air. They had sent out a police helicopter to search for this school bus. And that is the only way they found the school bus because from the road, from the ground, you could not see this school bus. It would only have been found by air. So the news broke that the school bus had been found, but no school children were on it. Ed was not on it. And when the news broke to the parents that their children were missing, but the school bus was found in this random field, I cannot even imagine. Like, I can't. That has got to be a worse nightmare for a parent. However, the police did have a very strong belief that the children were still alive. And they thought this because by the school bus, they could see tire tracks from two cars or vans. So the police actually did come to the conclusion that this was a kidnapping for ransom pretty quickly, which did give the police anyway, peace of mind that the school children will hopefully be returned alive. However, nothing can be for certain. Obviously, you can't just jump to that conclusion and think that it's right. So the FBI got involved. So 30 FBI agents made their way down to Chow Chilla. And literally, this just feels like a Criminal Minds episode, doesn't it? And I do think that there is an episode on Criminal Minds where a school bus of children go missing. They possibly were inspired by this case. I'm not sure though. And then the news soon Soon broke both nationwide and worldwide that 26 school children had been kidnapped. It was literally the first news story on all news channels all over the country. So that is what is going on back in Chowchilla. So back to the kidnappers. So of course they have left Chowchilla and they are now making their way 100 miles north to a rock quarry. The very rock quarry that Fred's dad owns the one that i told you about earlier that would be very significant they are driving to this rock quarry now of course this rock quarry is 100 miles away it does not take 12 hours to drive there but they needed to make sure that it was in the middle of the night when they arrived at the rock quarry so even though it didn't take 12 hours they were basically just driving around aimlessly waiting for the middle of the night so it is now 4 a.m no one is going to be at this rock quarry no one is going to disturb them. And the first thing that the vans do is they pull up to this big hole dug in the ground and sticking out of this hole is a ladder. And this ladder is going deeper into the ground, underground. So Fred opens up the van that contains Ed and he drags Ed from the van before slamming the van door shut. Now Fred wanted to make sure that he had Ed under control first because Ed is the adult and he poses the biggest threat to the whole operation. Now as you can imagine, Ed is completely dazed and confused. I mean he's been stuck in this van for 12 hours with barely any oxygen he's probably not thinking straight and he's probably terrified as well and fred demands that ed climbs down the ladder the ladder that is going into the floor that is going underground now ed is still complying completely with the three men because he is so terrified that if he puts a foot wrong all of those children are going to be killed. So Ed, feeling like he has no other option, he starts to climb down the ladder until he reaches the bottom. Now, when he finds himself at the bottom of the ladder, he looks around and he finds himself in a large room. And Ed thinks to himself, how the hell did I get into this room? Like, where the hell am I? I have just climbed down a ladder that was in the floor and now I'm in another room. However, once Ed looked around the room a bit more, he actually realized he was inside a metal truck trailer. And this truck trailer had been buried underground. And it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's even hard to picture 
all of this in your head. It's just so far-fetched. I just can't believe that this actually happens. Like this truck trailer is buried underground. What the hell? So now that Ed is trapped in this underground prison, the evil trio of Fred, Jim, and Rick start pulling out the other children from the vans one by one. They open up the van door. They grab a child, dragging them out of the van before shutting the van door again, leaving the children that are still in the van in complete darkness. With the child that they have dragged out of the van, they hold that child at gunpoint. They ask them their full name, their full address, their phone number before asking the child to remove an item of clothing because the perpetrators want all of this information plus the item of clothing to one, prove that they have the child and also two, know which parents that they need the ransom money off. So once they have all of this information and the item of clothing or the belonging from the child, they then force that child to climb down the ladder into the underground prison. And I just can't believe it. Like, I can't believe it. These children, some of them are as young as five years old and they are being dragged from the van one by one. They have been in that van for 12 hours. They are so scared. They are dazed, they're confused. They're probably dehydrated. They haven't had any food. And also the children that are still in the van, they haven't got a clue what is happening to the children that are being dragged out of the van. For all they know, the children are being dragged out of the van one by one to be killed. It is said that the children still left in the van were literally clinging onto the side of the van, hoping to prevent the perpetrators from dragging them out of the van. And eventually all the children are out of the van and then inside the underground prison. And once the children are inside the underground prison, they start to explore the surroundings. There is a small light on that is not giving that much light at all. There are some mattresses on the floor. There are makeshift toilets, which are essentially just wooden boxes with a hole in them. And there is also a table that has a small amount of food and water on it. Literally enough food for maybe four people. Definitely not enough food for 27 people. And then the evil perpetrators, they shout down the hole, we'll be back for you. They then pull the ladder up and out of the hole. They seal the hole with a metal plate and Ed and the children can't see this, but then two truck batteries, which are huge batteries that weigh about hundred pounds each are then placed onto the metal plate. And then inside the underground prison, Ed and the children can hear shoveling of dirt. And this is when Ed and maybe a few of the older kids, but they realize that they are being buried alive. And I feel like we just need to pause for a second here because what the hell? This is like such an elaborate plan, like it's crazy. And the three perpetrators were planning this for a very long time. Like I said, they were planning this for about a year. And I feel like we just need to talk about how they actually carried this out. So first of all, we know that they are using the rock quarry that belongs to Fred's dad. That is how they have access to that land. They found a plot of land on the quarry that wasn't really used that much. No one was really around. The three of them hire diggers and dig this huge hole. Next, they form a ramp down to this hole. And then this ramp is how they got the truck trailer underground. Because I remember when I first heard about this case, I was thinking, how the hell did they get the truck trailer underground? Well, they had built a ramp. That is how they did it. They built this ramp. They took this old truck trailer that they had bought using Fred's dad's money. They took this old truck trailer and yeah, put it down the ramp and underground. Once the truck trailer was underground, they did some modification of the trailer to make it into an underground prison. They made the makeshift toilets. They filled the truck with old mattresses. They also installed a very weak ventilation system. And then once all of these modifications were done, they completely buried the trailer, leaving just a small manhole, which obviously they used for the ladder to get everyone down there in the first place. And from above the ground, you could not see this trailer. They had actually done this really well. So if you were stood right over the underground prison, the underground truck trailer, 
you wouldn't even know it was there. Okay, so back to the kidnapping. It is now obviously the early hours of the 16th of July, 1976. The children and Ed were now completely buried. The manhole was covered. Everything was done. So the three perpetrators head back to Fred's house. And now the moment had come, the big moment to phone in their ransom demands. I literally don't know who the three of these people thought they were. Like they really have been watching too many films. So the three of them were getting really excited because the big moment had come. They were about to demand $5 million. So they phone up the Chowchilla police station to make their demands. Now they clearly were going to distort their voices in some kind of way because they were obviously not going to use their actual voices. So they've dialed the number, they're on the phone but they realize that all of the phone lines are blocked. Because this whole kidnapping had made national and worldwide news, the phone lines were flooded by concerned people, by friends and family, by journalists. And because the phone lines were so busy, the three perpetrators couldn't get through to make their demands. They thought it was just gonna be so simple, phone up, hey, I've got 26 school children, give me $5 million. So they give up. They think, oh, we'll have to think of some other way to get our demands in. Let's just take a nap. Uh-huh. They had been working so hard, bless them. I mean, they have been driving for over 12 hours. They had done so much work, they needed a nap. So all three of them, completely guilt-free, fell asleep straight away. And it would actually be this nap that would be their downfall. So meanwhile, back in the underground prison, the kids and Ed have been buried underground for a few hours now and things are just going from bad to worse. First of all, as we know, they have no way out whatsoever. Ed, for those first few hours, has been going around the trailer trying to like kick things or move things or like feeling the walls, trying to figure out if there is any way out. But of course, there isn't any way out apart from the way they all got in, that hole in the ceiling. On top of all of that, in the underground prison, after a few hours, it is getting incredibly stuffy. Like I said, there was ventilation, but it was so weak. It was basically just this little vent at the top of the trailer that was connected to a hose to a fan at the other end. And this fan that was connected outside was tiny. And then on top of all of that, the group were now running out of food and water. Like I said, there was not enough food and water for 27 people. And the kids at this point, they are going into full on meltdowns. I mean, of course they are. They were already completely frantic before, but now that there is basically no air, there is basically no way out. And now there is also no food and water. The makeshift toilets had also started to to completely fill up. So you can just imagine the smell in there as well. And the kids are screaming and crying and Ed is trying his best to keep the children calm because he knows if these children are crying, if they're screaming, if they're moving around too much, they'll be using up more oxygen. So Ed is trying to keep everyone as calm as possible. He is probably freaking out on the inside. And I honestly just cannot wrap my head around the conditions that they're in. I just can't wrap my head around the fact that these 26 children and Ed have been buried underground. Like I just can't wrap my head around it. How is this true? So now we get to 12 hours, uh-huh, 12 hours underground. And the evil trio are still napping by the way. And things in the underground prison are only getting worse. The situation has actually become fatal because you know that little ventilation system well, that stopped working. The fan completely ran out of batteries. So now there is zero fresh air being pumped into that underground trailer. But that is not the only problem. Oh no, because the roof of the trailer is starting to cave in. But it turns out that this evil trio didn't really think this through because they just put this old, I want to point out it was old, they put this old trailer underground and then shoved a load of dirt on top of it 
What did they think was going to happen? Well, the weight of everything is causing the roof to cave in. The sides of the trailer are also bowing as well. So Ed, maybe even the children, but especially Ed is thinking to himself, okay, so we have no way out. The ventilation has stopped. So we're either going to die of suffocation. We're either going to starve to death or now we are possibly going to be crushed. So this situation feels completely helpless at this point, but we now need to introduce the absolute hero of this story, who is 14 year old Mike Marshall. So Mike being 14, he was the oldest child there. So he was also helping, trying to keep the children calm, trying to figure out how to escape, rationing the food, etc. And Mike had been doing a really good job of stepping up because he's only 14 and he's having to take on all of this. But now is the time where he actually truly shines because Mike was thinking to himself, we are going to die down here. We need to escape. And he said, I am going to get everyone out of here. Mike was full of determination and drive. He fully believed that he could get everyone out of that underground trailer. And he said to Ed, we have to get out of here. We have to, and we have to get out the way we came in through that hole in the ceiling. And he asked Ed to help him. Now, Ed was skeptical. He didn't think that they would be able to escape through the hole, but Ed was also worried that if they got out of the hole in the ceiling, the three kidnappers would just be there waiting for them and they would shoot them. But Mike was like, okay, if they are, we're going to die anyway. So the escape begins. They first start by getting all of the mattresses because there was quite a few mattresses and they pile the mattresses on top of one another. So eventually it will be tall enough for both of them to actually be able to reach the hole in the ceiling. So when they get on top of the mattresses, they're both trying to push the metal plate, but it is way too heavy. I mean, that metal plate on its own is heavy enough, but remember those two truck batteries are on top of that plate, making it pretty much impossible to move. But Mike is so determined. I don't know what he is running on because he is probably suffering from dehydration. He has barely eaten. There is pretty much no oxygen down in this trailer. I don't know how he kept going, but he was determined. He kept pushing and pushing on this metal plate and it was starting to move a bit. And between Mike and Ed, they were starting to move the metal plate just a little bit, inch by inch. And as they were moving this metal plate, Ed started to believe that they could escape. So he was getting more into it as well. And the two of them working together managed to move this metal plate enough for Mike to fit his arm through and be able to feel what is on top of that metal plate. Now he could feel the batteries, but he couldn't work out quite what they were at first because he's obviously just feeling them. But again, with both of them working together and moving this plate kind of backwards and forth, rocking it and tilting it as well, they are able to slow slowly move the two batteries from the metal plate. And I must stress that this took a very, very, very long time. I know I have gone over that very, very quickly, but that would have taken them hours. So eventually after they have taken the two batteries off the plate, they are able to move the plate out of the way. And Mike is able to go through the hole in the ceiling. And I just can't believe like, how did both of them have that drive and that determination? It's absolutely incredible what the human body can do running on adrenaline. And all of the kids, once they had moved the metal plate, everyone was cheering. Everyone was so excited because they were like, oh my God, the metal plate has been moved. We're getting out of here. However, that celebration was short-lived because once Mike had climbed through the hole, he had realized that they weren't free at all. Instead, he had just ended up inside another wooden box that was also buried underground. So before the trio had left, they had placed a wooden box over the manhole and then they had buried this wooden box in the dirt. And Mike was pushing against this wooden box, but he could not make it budge. He could not push through. And I cannot even imagine what that would have felt like, how long it would have taken them to just get through 
that metal plate, that hole in the ceiling, to now come across another obstacle. And at this point, Ed had all but given up. He just thought, oh my God, there's no way. There's no way we're going to get out. We are still buried alive. But Mike, he did not give up. And thank God he didn't. He kept pounding on the box, hitting every single inch of that box over and over and over again. And after hitting the box for so long, all of a sudden the roof of the box gave way just a little bit. But that was all that Mike needed to carry on. Mike could now see the dirt above the box. So he continued on hitting that box, banging. More and more dirt started to show at the top of the box. And then he started to dig because he could. He had broken away that much of the box and he was just digging and digging through that dirt. All of a sudden, soil starts pouring all over him. He's done it. He's managed to literally hit and bang and dig his way out of this wooden box that is buried underground. A ray of sunlight bursts through and he is probably hit with the best smelling, freshest air he has probably ever smelled and breathed in his life. However, he is still terrified at this moment because of course he doesn't know what could possibly be on the other side. For all Mike knows, those three kidnappers are literally just sat there with their shotguns waiting. But even though he is absolutely terrified, he pulls himself up out of that hole and he jumps into the outside world ready to face whatever could possibly be waiting for him. But there is no one there. There is literally no one or nothing around. So Mike shouts down to Ed that the coast is clear, that no one is there waiting for them. And all of the children below are screaming and celebrating and they are so happy they are getting out. So Ed, who is still down in the trailer, helps each child out of the trailer one by one. So finally at 8 p.m. on the 16th of July, this was obviously the day after they had been kidnapped, but they had been buried under underground for 16 hours. And this was over 24 hours since they first were originally kidnapped. The 26 children and Ed had finally escaped. And I just feel like we all need to take a moment right now because I cannot believe this story. I still, even though I've researched it, even though I know it happened, it still just doesn't feel real. It's like, oh my God, how is it that 27 people were basically buried alive and they managed to escape. That is absolutely incredible. But of course, it's not over yet because they're in the middle of this rock quarry. They still need to get home. They need to get safe. So first, they can actually hear machinery, like big machinery in the background, and they're scared. Of course they are. They're worried that the sound of the machinery, the kidnappers will be there, but they have no other option. They have to head towards that sound because they're in the middle of nowhere. So they all head to the sound of the machinery. And this is when they come across a few construction workers that are still there. They haven't gone home yet for the day. And Ed shouts to them, we're from Chowchilla. We're from Chowchilla. We need help. Now, of course, these construction workers, they knew what happened in Chowchilla. They knew about the kidnapping. So they were like, oh, my God, these are the children that have been kidnapped. So of course the police are immediately called and finally, finally the children and Ed are rescued. They are first taken to a nearby health facility just to check them over, make sure that they're actually physically okay. And then at around midnight, all of the children and Ed were placed on a Greyhound bus to go back to Chowchilla. Now, a lot of the children were actually really apprehensive to get on that Greyhound bus. And I honestly do not blame them because the last time they got on a bus, they were buried alive. I mean, there is 27 of them, so how else are they going to transport them? But maybe somebody should have thought that through and maybe they should have all just gone in cars. I don't know, but anyway, they're all put on this bus and they go back to Chowchilla. And then at around four in the morning, they pull into the police station at Chowchilla and all of the parents are there waiting for them. And the children, one by one, they get off the bus. And oh my God, can you imagine imagine how happy that moment would have been.
And you know what? It's actually nice to have a happy ending, isn't it, to one of these cases. But now you're probably thinking, okay, so what the hell has happened to our three evil perpetrators? Because we haven't spoken about them for a while. Well, they're still all bloody napping, aren't they? Throughout this whole escape, they've been asleep. So finally, the next morning, they wake up and they turn on the TV and they realize that the 26 children and Ed have escaped. And they were in absolute disbelief. And I'm not gonna lie, I would have loved to have seen their faces when they realized that all of the children had been rescued because they were so cocky about this. They had truly thought that they had committed the perfect crime. And all of these school children, they had beaten them. And I'm so happy about that, I am. And I'm so happy that their nap was their downfall. But the funniest thing of all is that they never actually got to make their ransom demands. That I I'm sorry, I take so much joy in that because obviously that is what they wanted. They wanted that thrill, that control. They wanted to phone in and say, give me $5 million and you'll get your children back. And I am so happy that they didn't get to do that. We all have to take these moments in these cases because we don't get them very often. We have to take joy in things like this. And once they had realized that they have basically been beaten, Fred Woods and Jim Schoenfeld, they pack their bags and they run. They, they run, they think they can outrun the law. Whereas Rick Schoenfeld, he stays back and he just tries to lay low. But they were not gonna get away with this, mm -mm, no, no. Now, when it came to the police investigation, they were determined to find out who had done this. They were not about to let them get away. Now, because the three evil perpetrators had worn pantyhose over their faces, the children and Ed couldn't really give a description of what they looked like. But this wouldn't actually slow down the investigation too much. So the police, of course, go to the underground trailer just to see what clues there could be in the trailer. They also speak to the security at the rock quarry and the security said that they saw three men a few months ago digging a very large hole and one of those men were Fred Woods, who just so happened to be the son of the owner of the rock quarry. So then they look into Fred Woods, of course, and we know that he has prior convictions for Grand Theft Auto. And then of course, this directly led the police to Jim and Rick Schoenfeld, who went everywhere with Fred. They also had that prior conviction. And of course, the children and Ed were able to tell them that there were three perpetrators. So now the police have their three suspects. They have Fred, Jim and Rick. And as soon as they go to Fred's house, they found so much evidence. They found so much evidence in Fred's bedroom. They found all of the plans of the kidnapping. They realized that they had been planning this for at least a year and a half. They literally found a piece of paper that said the word plan at the top, uh huh. like literally, you couldn't get more stupid. On this piece of paper, it had like bullet point after bullet point after bullet point of what the plan was supposed to be. They even found a draft of the ransom letter demanding $5 million. So this was pretty much case closed. They had their three suspects and they were pretty certain that these three people had done this kidnapping. I mean, there was so much evidence, it was absolutely ridiculous. And I just don't understand, like I really don't, how the hell did they think they were going to get away with this? when they are so stupid that they all sit down with a piece of paper and write plan at the top, underline it, and then literally go into so much detail, bullet point after bullet point of what they're gonna do. Also, Fred has fled, obviously. Why didn't he take any of this with him? So later on that same day, Rick Schoenfeld, who was the younger brother, actually handed himself in. And then his brother, Jim Schoenfeld, was found just a little bit later, literally fleeing across the US. And then two whole weeks later in Vancouver, Canada, the ringleader, Fred Woods, was finally caught. He had fled all the way to Canada and he was finally brought back to California to face justice. The case then went to trial where all three of them pled guilty to 27 counts of kidnapping for ransom. And when they were asked, why did you do this? This is when Jim Schoenfeld said that even though they had come from wealthy families, both himself and Fred 
were deeply in debt. And when they were asked, why did you kidnap a school bus full of children? He said, quote, we needed multiple victims to get multiple millions and we picked children because children are precious. The state would be willing to pay ransom for them and they don't fight back. So that was their explanation. They basically chose children because they thought that they would be worth more money and also because they're incredibly vulnerable and they don't fight back. However, it wasn't that straightforward because they did plead guilty to the 27 counts of kidnapping, but for some reason they refused to plead guilty to the eight counts of bodily harm that was set against them. So that meant that the trial was dragged on for longer and 16 months after they were abducted and buried alive, some of the children were brave enough to actually take the stand and give their account of what happened and how it affected them. They said that the evil men did actually cause them bodily harm. They had cuts, they had bruises. They also had burns on their body. They were also starved. They were also dehydrated. They had a lack of oxygen. All of these things could cause bodily harm. And that is on top of the emotional trauma that they went through, the psychological trauma. And the jury, after seeing this brave testimony from the children, along with the overwhelming police evidence, they decided to find all three of them guilty. And Rick Woods, Jim Schoenfeld, and Rick Schoenfeld were all sentenced to life without parole. And that was the case of the Chow Chilla kidnapping. And that has to be one of the craziest cases I think I've ever researched. The fact that these 26 children, and obviously at 27 people, were buried alive and they managed to escape. I'm sorry, that is absolutely incredible. They found the strength to survive. They found the strength to carry on. And Mike, I'm sorry, he is a hero and Ed, but both of them, Mike, because he was only 14, he is such a hero in this story. And the evil trio, as we call them. I think they committed this because they're privileged, they were bored, they were thrill seekers. And I also think that because of who they were, because of who their families were, and because they were so wealthy, I don't really think they thought about consequences to their actions. Because all of their lives, especially Fred, they've never really been held accountable for what they have done. So why would they think any differently about this? They probably thought that even if they did get caught, mommy and daddy would just be able to get them off anyway, but thankfully that was not the case. However, I do have one very unfortunate update for all of you. So even though they were all originally sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, it turns out that after an appeal, that was overturned. Their conviction for bodily harm were overturned, which meant that the three of them were resentenced and then they were sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. And then in 2012, Rick Schoenfeld, after spending 36 years in prison at the age of 58, was released. And then in 2015, his older brother, Jim Schoenfeld, was released at the age of 63. However, Fred, the ringleader, didn't get out so soon because it turned out from prison, he was actually running an illegal car business with his parents' trust fund. I'm sorry, how? How is someone in prison and they are running an illegal car business? How are they doing that? How does he have access to his trust fund? I'm sorry, how are we allowing this to happen? He was also found to possess contraband and pornography and also cell phones on multiple occasions. And he was denied parole 19 times. But then finally, in August of 2022, Fred Woods was granted parole at the age of 70. And I just want to point out that because his family come from old money, Fred is now ridiculously rich. Mm -hmm. He's out of prison and he's ridiculously rich. I'm sorry, why? But I just want to end this video focusing on the victims of this story, the children and Ed. Because even though this is a survivor story and it does have a happier ending, this does not mean that the children did not have lasting effects because of what happened 
happened to them, their lives on that day, on the 15th of July, were changed forever. Many of the children developed so many fears about what had happened to them. Many of them were scared of the dark, scared of the wind. Many of them have suffered panic attacks. Many of them have suffered from depression. Most of the children had terrible nightmares about the kidnapping, about being kidnapped, about death. And some of the children who are obviously now adults continue to report some of those symptoms to this very day. However, given that a lot of them have gone on to live very full, healthy lives. And whilst we don't know all of the identities of the children, a few of them have come forward in various documentaries to talk about their experience and the lasting effects it has had on them, including Mike, who was the hero of the story. And Mike has had a very difficult life. He has definitely suffered because of this kidnapping, but I am so happy to say that he has actually turned his life around and he he seems really happy and he's doing really well for himself, which just warms my heart. I'm so happy for him. Ed Ray, the bus driver, was given an award for outstanding community service following the kidnapping and has since gone on to be held the local hero for keeping all of the children safe and alive. And I just hope that all of those children who are obviously adults now, I just hope that they're all happy and I just hope that they've been able to find peace. And that is the end of the Chow Chilla kidnapping story. And I just want to say at the end of this video that this is my last video of the year and I did want to end it on a little bit more of a happier note. I just want to thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart for your support this year because I am not going to lie, 2022 has hit me like a ton of bricks. And I just want to thank you guys so much for all of your support and your nice comments. It really does warm my heart and I cannot even tell you how many times you guys have actually kept me going and you don't even know it. So I just want to thank you all so much. You guys mean the absolute world to me. I love you all so much. You have helped me through an incredibly tough year. Just wanted to thank you all so much. I'm not going to cry at the end of this video. <laughs> and I will be back in January. Don't worry. I don't know the exact date yet, but of course I'll keep you all updated. And I just hope that you all have a really nice, peaceful, fun, safe holiday season and new year and I'll wish you all a happy holidays now and a happy new year and yeah I'll see you all in 2023. Wow let's hope that 2023 is a better year for all of us because we all deserve it. We all deserve it. These last few years like can we stop now please? Universe can we stop? Thank you again to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video and that is everything from me. I love you guys so 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 much and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.